and welcome to Left, Right, Center. I'm Sean Boyd. We begin with some good news for homeowners. Your taxes are coming down. State lawmakers wrapped up a four-day special session by passing a bill that, combined with an earlier measure, will save property owners $1.6 billion a year and prevent the kind of spikes many homeowners saw last year from happening again. In exchange, the proponents of two ballot measures that would have made deeper cuts say they'll pull them. I just want to say, yes, this is a great day. For now Senator Barb Kirkmeyer, passage of the property tax relief bill is a win for people like her 94-year-old neighbor. Today is the day I get to go home and tell my neighbor, my 94-year-old friend, that yes, she'll probably be able to stay in her home because we got additional property tax relief for her and for all Coloradoans and for small businesses. Kirkmeyer and Senator Chris Hansen among the architects of the bill, a compromise forged with proponents of two ballot measures. This is very significant relief when you add up everything that we've done. Um, and I think you've done it in a very targeted and responsible way. The Office of State Planning and Budget says the compromise, combined with another bill passed in the spring, will cut taxes two to three hundred dollars a year, depending on where you live. In Denver, homeowners will save two hundred thirty-three dollars on average next year. In Adams, three hundred twenty-four dollars. Garfield, one hundred eighty-eight. And Pueblo, one hundred seventy-three. And the savings go up in twenty twenty-six. Commercial and industrial property taxes will also drop, and future increases in property taxes will be capped at 5 to 6 percent going forward. We do think that it's a win for taxpayers. Michael Fields, head of Advance Colorado, one of the groups behind the ballot measure, says the cap on future increases was non-negotiable. There's nothing that was in place that would stop another huge spike like that without this bill passing or without our measures passing. So we didn't want to risk uh, getting no relief for people, getting no cap for people. The legislature held up its end of the bargain and Field says so will he by pulling his ballot measures. We don't have any credibility if we don't follow through with our word, um, but it works both ways. If they don't follow through with their word and they change the deal or go back and try to change stuff, we still have the ability to move forward. Governor Polis says a deal's a deal. This is a real win for Colorado, uh, and I'm excited. It'll make Colorado more competitive, put more money in people's pockets, and give people the confidence that their rates won't go up too much in the future. All right, let's bring in our analysts, Republican Dick Wadhams here in person, and Democrat Mike Dino is joining us by Zoom this week. So, Mike, let me start with you. The bill passed with wide bipartisan support. The no votes came from the far right, who wanted the ballot measures to go forward, and the far left, who compared the deal to extortion. Should the governor and legislative leaders have negotiated with the ballot measure proponents? Does the process matter here? Well, I think if they had more time, uh, you know, they were really getting down to having to uh, time limit next week to, to pull the ballot measures. And, uh, and, you know, I think there was a lot of consternation about doing a special session. As we talked about, there was a very good bipartisan deal that they reached at the end of the state legislative session last spring. And so people were having a hard time imagining what, what are we going to do better? Uh, there were some feelings that the ballot measures may not have turned out to be successful. And so let's just leave it alone. And then, you know, they finally, in, in a smaller group, uh, getting to the process issue, uh, decided let's, let's call a special session and see if we can do better. And I do think, you know, some people we saw obviously on the floor feel over in the House, particularly on the left, that, you know, th this is unfair to this legislative body to just be told what to do by the governor's office and by special interests. And it says it sets a bad precedent. And uh, I do think the process will will influence what happens in the future in the sense that if, uh, you know, the governor wants to cut a special deal with special interests, uh, people are going to remember that. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, the big thing here was they were so worried about these ballot measures going forward because while this is a $1.6 billion cut, for homeowners and small businesses, the ballot measures would have been two and a half billion, mm -hmm. so so much more <laughs> significant, and the state would have had to backfill lost right. revenue to schools. So, Dick Michael Fields with Advance Colorado, one of the groups that right. behind the ballot measures, told me, you know, Coloradans who don't feel like this deal went far enough, and and some are of that mind, you know, should press their local governments for more relief because the locals 
could have lowered the right. tax rate, you know, back when uh, the valuations shot up, you know, yes. their mill levies, they could have brought down, but um, most of them didn't. And I'm not sure Coloradans <laughs> understand that part of it. Probably not. I bet they get more savvy about that kind of stuff now. It's after, so complicated uh, this is, it, property it taxes. Is. And Douglas County did try, if, if you recall. They were rejected by the state. But um, the, the fact is, is that it, no, local governments will not do this unless they are pressured by property taxpayers within their, their jurisdictions. And I think that, that property taxpayers are going to get um, more involved in this discussion. Uh, because I, the other thing, Sean, I don't think a lot of property taxpayers are going to think this is a huge reduction in their property taxes. They're going to be grateful for what they got, yeah. but uh, they're going to want more and because <laughs> it shot up so high to begin with yeah. that uh, this is fairly modest what they did. It's significant. I'm not trying to diminish it, but it's not as uh, great per as some homeowner, tax. On a per homeowner right. basis, yeah. right. So this <laughs> bill also allows local governments to go to voters and ask them, although the ballot language has to be very clear. Can we raise this cap? Can we waive this cap and keep more money? Right. How many local governments do you think will go back to voters and ask for that? Once again, without pressure from the constituents, it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> they will go back and ask, or they won't go back and ask to keep more money. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they will go back and ask for more money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they will, and and I think they'll they'll get a lot of pushback from from taxpayers. I really do. Yeah. So, Mike, fire districts pushed really hard down at the Capitol for an exemption, saying for many departments, revenue hasn't kept up with inflation for years, and they're entirely funded by property taxes. Several lawmakers mm -hmm. said that the state needs to step in and help them. Do you see that happening? Well, it, it is hard to imagine because the state is uh, next year uh, going to find themselves fairly uh, budget, uh, budgetarily constrained. Uh, compared to previous years, uh, all the pandemic relief money has uh, is been accounted for by the end of this year. Certainly, we're seeing state revenues uh, begin to not grow as fast, if not decline slightly. Um, and um, and so uh, to help, you know, the, the firefighters and the fire districts are, are a, a very well liked constituency. Let's let's say that uh, their their pleas will not fall on deaf ears, but it will be hard to find the money. Right, especially, I think, since the state is going to have to backfill some of the lost revenue to schools. It's unclear yeah, how much well, that's going to be. It could be up to 80 know, million. Yeah, as you know, there, you know, the, the governor and in the legislature uh, crowed about how they've, you know, fully funded K through 12 right. in, in this past legislative session. So uh, they certainly don't want to go back on that. You're right, Sean. Right. Dick, the governor told me this upcoming session, starting in January, lawmakers are going to tackle, instead of the property taxes, homeowners insurance, which is also really Yes. driven up costs uh, for homeowners across the state. Some can't even get insurance. I've right. done reports on that. Do you see this bipartisanship that we've seen on property taxes continuing into this next session? I do, and I'll, I'll tell you why, Sean, because I think the Democratic leadership in both houses has figured out that even though Republicans are so vastly outnumbered in both houses, that they still have numbers that they can help them push through stuff. And that's what happened here. I mean, the Democrats lost their far left. They had to, they had to compensate with that with, with Republican votes. And so, and, and it's no, it, it is not insignificant that Barb Kirkmeyer was the person that you featured in that film clip from mm -hmm. that press conference. She is a big player. She knows what she's talking about. Democrats look to her for leadership on this. And so uh, I think the Democratic leadership has figured out that this is a good thing to do, and it, it, it helps them. And so, uh, yeah, I do think that that will happen. In the House, you see Julie McCluskey and uh, Minority Leader Rose Puglisi yes. also working very closely Rose together. And, and, and I think is a star, and, and, uh, Lisa, uh, and uh, they're just, the Republicans, I think, rose to the challenge in this session. I really do. Yeah. All right, coming up, the Colorado Republican Party ousts its chair, but he refuses to leave the standoff next. Welcome back to Left, Right, Center. Having covered politics for nearly 15 years, I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but nothing quite like the ongoing drama in the Colorado Republican Party. 
A week ago, the Central Committee voted to oust party chair Dave Williams and replace him with Eli Bremer. But Williams has refused to leave, so Bremer filed a lawsuit calling him a squatter and asking the court to evict him. Williams' supporters filed a counter lawsuit claiming the vote was illegitimate and calling Bremer a squatter, hack, and identity thief. Tick, this is just, I mean, it's just so embarrassing. Embarrassing for the it party. Is. It's just, it's nuts. You know, really, it's like a soap opera. You know, Williams has been the center of one controversy after yes. another. Does he really have that much support? And how, how do you see this ending? Probably in the courts, or the Republican National Committee will intervene, like they did in Michigan, when a Dave Williams lookalike in uh, Michigan got elected, and the party central committee removed her, and then um, uh, the RNC had to come in and say, "Get out! You're you're gone." So they had to intervene. But, Sean, this is Labor Day weekend. This is the time when you really kick in your get-out-the-vote effort that, that you've been building throughout the, 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 the political cycle. Presumably. Nothing is going on in the Colorado Republican Party because Dave Williams has spent all his time attacking other Republicans, impugning the integrity and the reputation of his predecessor, Christy Burton Brown, of, 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 of attacking gays and lesbians, of, of, um, of intervening in primaries, spending party money on his own campaign. I mean, he has been doing everything but what a state chairman should be doing. And it's, 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 it's more than embarrassing. It's just flat out disgusting and, um, and irresponsible. And this guy will go down in history as the, as the worst state chair of either party uh, in Colorado history. There's no doubt about it. And I don't know where it's going to end. It will probably continue right through the election, frankly. But it's a fight that needs to happen. Yeah. Mike, what impact do you see this having on the November election? Well, I think Dix has said it all, really. <laughs> I mean, but uh, a few things. I mean, uh, there are some competitive races out there. Uh, and we are just one seat away in the state Senate, uh, the, the, the Colorado State Senate, from a veto-proof majority. We already mm -hmm. have it in the, in the state house. And so the Republicans are trying to avoid, one, they want to avoid a veto-proof majority probably over in the state Senate and would like to get a little more equity over in the state house. And uh, as Dick pointed out, the party's not helping their candidates. And we've seen that out there in the public already, that candidates are like, hey, we're, we're flying on our own. There's no help from the state party. Yeah, speaking of competitive races, Congressional District 8, one of those. Uh, this past week, Colorado Congresswoman Yadira Caraveo revealed she has been struggling morning, with depression so and sought treatment at Walter Reed Medical Center. Caraveo is running for re-election against Republican Gabe Evans in Congressional District 8, a race that could decide control of the U.S. House. So, Mike, Caraveo said she shared her diagnosis and, and her getting treatment for it uh, because she wants to help de-stigmatize mental illness. Will this impact the race, do you think? I, I don't think it will impact it in a negative way. I, I think it could have a lot of uh, possibilities for being positive. Uh, we just saw a report this week that it's hazardous to be a parent and, and, and what it does to uh, parents' mental health uh, to raise children and, and you know so we I think everybody can sympathize with the anxieties and stress that are out there and 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 how important our mental health is so I, I do commend her for bringing that to the forefront uh, also though you know she's beginning she's she's buying a lot of ad time and her first ad or her first series of ads will probably focus on her bipartisanship uh, in 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 Congress which to me will be even a, a more important factor in a very tight race in the 8th Congressional, uh, where voters probably will appreciate somebody who's working on both sides of the aisle. So Dick Caraveo told Colorado Public Radio that she was worried about her diagnosis being used against her in this race. Um, but uh, Gabe Evans did release a statement as, as soon as um, he learned of her diagnosis and treatment, uh, saying his heart goes out to her. He's had friends who've, who've sure. suffered from depression. Um, do you see this impacting the race? No, and, and Gabe was right to say that. And we all have had friends and relatives who have had uh, bouts of depression. The only criticism I would say is that I think she should have revealed this to her constituents earlier. I mean, this uh, the Walter Reed um, 
uh, stay was uh, four months ago, and I, I think that I, I think that should have been revealed to her constituents sooner. But um, no, I mean, listen, uh, we just saw a president of the United States who withdrew from the race because he was physically and mentally not able to continue, and and that was that was concealed for a long time by his family and people around him in the White House. Um, I just think, uh, and, and that's wrong that that happened. I just think it's better when, when public officials come clean about their, 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 their health uh, mm -hmm. with their constituents. I think that's what the situation is here. Yeah, I, I don't see this being used against no, her, though. No, I, no, it, no, no, no. Knowing Gabe Evans, I don't see no, him. No, Gabe certainly. is a good man, and he will not do that, no. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching Left, Right, Center. We'll see you next time.